You're watching WatchGuard Security Week in Review, a video podcast dedicated to quickly summarizing the biggest information and network security stories each week. I'm Corey Nockreiner, your host, and this is the episode for the week starting March 26th. This week I'll cover botnet takedowns, some nasty Mac malware, and a lot of security updates you should be aware of. This week started with the news of a number of botnet takedowns, beginning with Microsoft's takedown of some of the Zeus-related command and control servers. Uh, recently, Microsoft's been using legal action to try to take down botnet networks. In this case, Microsoft used the RICO Act, or the Racketeer Influenced and Corrupt Organization Act, to file a civil lawsuit against a bunch of unnamed parties. Unnamed in that uh, Microsoft only lists their known aliases, not their actual personal identification. But by submitting this civil case, Microsoft was able to get enough influence to actually raid a couple of hosting uh, organizations in the United States and take down a number of Zeus's command and control servers. Now this doesn't mean they've arrested any bot herders yet. But taking down these command and control servers will at least temporarily affect these bot herders' operations. So it's probably a good thing. There was also a second botnet takedown that was highlighted this week. This one was done by Kaspersky and a group of other partners. Now this takedown was different in that it was actually technical. Kaspersky, who's one of WatchGuard's partners, was going after the Kelios botnet. This is actually a botnet they'd actually tried to take down before with Microsoft, but as soon as they took over the server, the attackers eventually brought up servers again. Now the way Kaspersky actually takes over botnets and gets rid of them is by sinkholing. Uh, Kelios is actually a peer-to-peer -peer botnet. So Kaspersky and partners were able to create a client, a bot client that pretended to be part of the peer-to-peer -peer network. They then used the peer-to-peer -peer channel to kind of poison all the clients to point to Kaspersky's own command and control servers, thus kind of hijacking all the victims and pointing them to more benign command and control servers. A similar method the FBI has been using for the DNS changer malware. So now Kaspersky has their command and control servers up, sinkholing all these Kelios victims. They do plan on informing ISPs so victims can remove the software. Again, this doesn't mean they've arrested any bot herders, but it does take one more botnet offline. This week there is a number of various software and hardware security updates you should be aware of. The big one comes from Cisco. Cisco has a biannual patch day. On the third Wednesday of every March and September, Cisco releases a bunch of typically iOS updates. Uh, this week, they released nine iOS security bulletins fixing a number of vulnerabilities. The vulnerabilities affected many iOS components, from their NAT component to their reverse SSH component to uh, their Ike component. The majority of these updates fixed denial of service vulnerabilities in all these iOS components. So generally, by sending specially crafted traffic to your Cisco iOS device or through your iOS device, whether it be a router or a switch or whatever, an attacker could leverage these vulnerabilities to reload that device. This also means that if he repeatedly leverages these vulnerabilities, he could put your device in a denial of service uh, condition. And of course, if this is your gateway router, he could leverage this to actually take your network offline. So if you're a Cisco iOS administrator, you should definitely check out Cisco's updates. Another big update this week comes from Adobe, who released a yet another update to Flash Player. This update fixed two uh, remote code execution vulnerabilities. So basically, if an attacker can entice you to go to a website and you have Flash, the attacker could leverage this in a drive-by download attack or something like that. One other note about this update is Adobe's also added a silent updater to their product. This means if you choose to configure it, you can make it so Flash Player will automatically get the latest update without any user interaction. Might be a good thing for you to set on your client machines. And again, it seems like I mention this every week, but Google released another update for Chrome, this time Chrome 18. It fixes another nine security vulnerabilities. I won't go into a ton of detail, but if you have Chrome, make sure to update. One final tidbit of news for all you Mac users out there. I too, by the way, am a Mac user for my personal computers. Yet another Mac Trojan has been found in the wild. 
This particular Trojan was found by Alien Vault. It arrives as what seems to be a spear phishing uh, email targeting Tibetan organizations. Uh, the email comes with a Word document. And if you open this Word document, it exploits a three-year-old vulnerability in the Mac version of Office to execute code on your machine. It's kind of interesting in that it's one of the first uh, pieces of Mac malware to actually use an Office or Word vulnerability. Once it exploits its code on your machine, it then erases the evil file and replaces it with a benign Word document. It also installs a script that tries to keep some persistence on your client computer so it can stay on your Mac through reboots. Of course, the malware is designed to connect back to command and control servers, which appear to be in China, so attackers can do a number of nasty things against your Mac computer. So if you do have a Mac and you're one of the people that feel like they're virus proof, you should probably change this attitude. Mac computers are just as vulnerable as Windows computers if you don't remain vigilant against attacks. So it's time to maybe start to think about security software on Mac computers and being careful what you download or click on. Uh, one of the small tools I like to use on my Mac is a program called Little Snitch. It's a local host firewall that tells me about every outgoing connection. Besides allowing me to control incoming and outgoing connections, it also will maybe be able to inform me if there's a piece of malware that's making outbound connections to a command and control server. I recommend you try it. That covers this episode. As usual, if you like more regular security updates, follow me on Twitter. I'm at SecAdept. You should also check out our WatchGuard Security Center blog. And by the way, I'll also be posting another episode of Radio Free Security, our iTunes podcast, to the blog this week. So be sure to check that out. As usual, thanks for watching. And at WatchGuard, we're rooting for you.